So, uh, for those of you who do not actually know me, um, my name is Megan Dennis. I am a third year PhD student at the University of York. Uh, my research is broadly involved with digital archaeological ethics. And today I'm going to talk you through one component of my work and my dissertation. So, um, as was described, um, I work within the emerging field of archaeogaming. So, this is, um, this is the idea that we use video games and material space to study creating culture, with the idea that anything that goes into a game um, that is culture within a game effectively has to come from us as an external source for creating the culture. And so we can look at traces of our own cultures through the way they manifest within games. Um, we also use game spaces to engage with archaeological concepts. We use them to create replicable excavations. We use them to test theoretical models. Um, and if you're interested in looking what we are doing as a field beyond the papers that we had in the session today, um, I would encourage you to look up the archaeogaming hashtag on Twitter uh, or to go to the Value Foundation website where they have a lot of previous work, uh, previous talks stored so you can kind of get a sense of where the field is and where we've been emerging. Um, and now that I have made those particular plugs for everything, uh, these are the four big questions that I'm attempting to answer in my dissertation. Um, first, how are archaeological ethics present or absent in video games? Uh, do players of video games recognize the presence or absence? Do they care about the presence or absence? Um, should we care about the presence or absence of archaeological ethics? Uh, and most importantly, does participation in unethical practices via video games influence the perceptions, attitudes, and behavior towards real-world archaeology and heritage? Uh, and this, is, this has been an interesting process for me. Um, so because video games are an experiential media uh, in which players are effectively actors situated within a virtual world, they potentially have agency, and they're asked to engage with the content of those worlds in a different ways than they would through the passive reception of other types of media. So um, film and television, you can be quite a, a passive receiver. The information is provided to you, you take it in through your eyeballs, uh, and then you make decisions on it, but you don't actually have much say in how the process actually works. Whereas in um, games and archaeology, uh, you have to be much more of an active participant. Um, so what does it mean for players that they have this relationship with archaeology in games, and what does it mean for us as archaeologists? So as one component of my attempt to answer these questions, um, I conducted an internet-based survey that ran for 30 days in the spring of 2017. Uh, I pushed it out via social media, I went through communication with a number of archaeology departments, um, worldwide, I went through direct contact with game developers. The, I think the most surreal moment of the process for me was when one of the devs for Riot tweeted this out to like their 70,000 followers, and I suddenly saw my survey results go like all over the place. That was crazy. <laughs> um, uh, and I went through advertising in internet and physical spaces where game players communicate and congregate. So actual game playing cafes, uh, comic book stores, as well as online forums, uh, and what us olds would call bulletin board systems. Um, out of that, I received over 500 responses, 428 of which were complete. So surveys that were incomplete were not included in my analysis because due to, com to compliance with my ethics policy, um, it stipulated that non-completion of the survey, which meant not finishing the survey, was a potential option for you to opt out of having your data used. So while I retained the non-completed uh, responses, I'm not including them in the data. Uh, the surveys allowed for open answers for about half of the total questions, which made 4,677 lines of textual response. Every single line of which I put through a process of open coding um, based in grounded theory and, and textual coding and facilitated through NVivo. Uh, in the survey, uh, all participants were asked to self-identify as one of four potential categories, either as an archaeologist, as a person who plays video games, as an archaeologist who plays video games, or as someone 
who considers themselves neither an archaeologist nor a video game player. So I'm gonna go over some very preliminary results out of this survey and show you the places where these four groups come together and where they diverge from their opinion on uh, representations of archaeology and archaeological ethics in video games. And um, at the risk of blowing anyone's anonymity, is there anyone in here who took the survey? Some hands, a couple of people who took the survey? Okay, all right. Well, hopefully you'll either see yourself or not see yourself uh, in this process. So, um, the first group that we're going to look at are archaeologists. So people in this group do not self-identify as playing or engaging purposefully with video games or games media. But as you see from this quote, that doesn't mean that this group is unaware of or unfamiliar with some of the representational tropes of archaeology in video games. Um, the responses still very clearly showed that they were aware of, of games media. Uh, this group was only 13% of completed respondents, which I thought was kind of interesting in terms of how the numbers played out. Um, it was, they were largely concerned with representational issues. Uh, they care about how archaeology and archaeologists appear in media. They have experienced the transmedial reality of archaeology, that representations in films and television have impacted what representation in games look like, and that now we're back in this sort of feedback loop where now the way that we show archaeology in games is starting to affect the way that it's shot in film and television. Um, so it's going the other direction. Interestingly, um, this group is also really grounded in the idea of their own expertise uh, and expressed a feeling that they had a superior grasp of fact versus fiction. Um, and there was a large attitude of dismissiveness towards the non-archaeological public's ability to distinguish fact from fiction. So they gave me a lot of adamant responses that archaeologists have a duty to challenge fictionalized representations of archaeology and a responsibility to effectively set the public straight about what it is uh, to be an archaeologist. So the second group that we're going to look at are non-archaeologists who self-identify as players in video games. These were, um, there were some questions within the branch of this survey that allowed participants to clarify what they meant and by their self-identity and how central uh, the identity was to them. And so this group, they were allowed to, to identify how central video game playing was to their personal identity. And there was a lot of stuff in there that is not necessarily archeological, but is definitely interesting to look at as far as how that group self-identifies. Um, this group is about 31% of respondents. Uh, it showed that outside of the formally trained world of archaeology that opinions were really mixed on authenticity. And um, I, I found it interesting that Angus mentioned authenticity earlier. Um, I really wish that Tara Cobblestone, who was initially going to do a paper in the session, could have been here because she's done a lot of work on what archaeological authenticity in media means, especially in games media. So if that's something that you are thinking about or concerned about, I would really suggest that you look up her work uh, because she's done a lot of really great work on that. Uh, among this group, there was a widespread knowledge of the larger canon of video games that include archaeology and heritage. Uh, the respondents brought up a lot of examples ranging from the late 70s until today and were very keen on asserting their ownership over the archaeology and video games through their participation as players. Um, that said, there were some really serious misunderstandings of the role of archaeologists in developing games that include archaeology. Uh, there was a, an overassumption of the participation of archaeologists in the development process and confusion over why, as archaeologists, we get upset with bad archaeology and video games since they believe that we must obviously be involved in this process, which I think a number of us in the room right now know is not the case. So the third group that we're going to look at are these people who self-identified as both archaeologists and video game players. Um, again, participants were given the chance to detail how central each of these labels were to their conception of self. And within this group, more participants centered their identity on being video game players and noted that while they work in, study in, or research in archaeology, they don't consider being archaeological knowledge makers to be the defining feature of their self-identity which is, I, I think, something as a discipline that I'm not sure if that's centered in the idea that we have started to think about archaeology as, as profession versus vocation um, versus calling. I don't know. I think there's something there. 
Um, so this group was, again, this was about uh, 31, 34% of the completed respondents. Uh, and this group was really, really wordy. Um, if you participated and you were in this group, y'all wrote a lot of stuff. Um, there were a lot of anecdotes about game playing uh, and archaeology and how these things were entwined in people's lives. There was a lot of emphasis that day to day um, they, they mediate their position between archaeological knowledge producers and archaeological media consumers primarily through humor. Um, the term eye roll came up a lot. I had to code the word eye roll quite a bit. Um, it, as well as a desire to counter representational issues. Um, one quote that I really liked was, when I get asked if I'm like Lara Croft, I roll my eyes and say, sure, let me just go get my short shorts and pistols. I left them in my office. So there's a lot of personal conflict expressed in their responses. They recognize the poor representation they're being provided, and they recognize that the archeological choices that they make in games run directly counter to how they behave in their professional lives but they still love the games. Um, they still enjoy playing the games. They very much embody Anita Sarkeesian's message in looking at women in video games, which representationally share some of the same problems and conflicts when she says it's, it's okay to be critical of the media that you love. Um, this group, I felt, was really encompassing that as an idea about how they approach everything. Um, the final group with the survey were the non-video game playing non-archaeologists uh, who, believe it or not, made up 11% of the survey sample because some people will answer a survey about anything. Uh, this group was asked because they don't play video games, um, where do they get their information about archaeology and archaeologists? And television far and away was the biggest place that they named. And they recognized, though, that there was a disconnect between television archaeology and what they thought real archaeology probably was. And what I thought was interesting about this group was that despite self-identifying as non-archaeologists, when they got to the open section of their questions, many actually revealed that they had formerly been in the sector. They were retired, they had left academia, they were employed in contexts like museums where they didn't consider themselves active archaeologists anymore. I think that brings up some really interesting questions about how we view ourselves and our roles in archaeology um, and, and what it means for the way people go in and out of ideas of professional identity. Uh, having looked at where these groups differ, the places where they intersect, let's look at that. So responses show that video game representations of archaeology have become transmedial. They're now outside of games themselves and in the wider culture. Uh, the responses show that there are concerns across groups about what is real and what is authentic and what that means. There was a cross-group emphasis that video games should be fun. Um, one quote I didn't list but that I love was about how a game spent watching a big digger for weeks and not finding anything was probably also not a fun game. So anybody who's ever done a watching brief, do you want to play a game of a watching brief? Probably not. The uh, biggest thing they showed in total was that video games impart more direct experiences of archaeology, but that they're still not selling it as a field the same way that television is. Uh, TV is still beating games in terms of immediate recall, which is interesting in light of the fact that the games industry is now a larger monetary producer hour for hour and dollar for dollar than the television industry. So, what's next? Um, I'm taking this data and combining it with the results of content analysis concerning ethical representations in games uh, and with additional interviews and gameplay sessions, and my goal is to use these combined methods to determine what it would take to create and implement a video game that fulfilled both the criteria of being fun and is ethical in its representation of archaeology and archaeologists. On top of this, I'm working on a code of ethics and best practices for digital archaeology uh, and for archaeologists specifically working in gaming and virtual spaces. Um, and as was announced yesterday, I'm working through CAA um, uh, on the board as an ethics officer and I'm working through SAA as a member of the ethics committee to attempt to find ways to make it easier for digital archaeologists to situate their work in a solid base of ethical practice. So cross time, cross fingers. Um, this time next year I'm gonna demo the ethical archaeological video game. So I hope to see you all then. Um, I wanna thank Sarah Perry, who's my supervisor, for supporting this. Uh, the members of the hashtag uh, archaeogaming uh, community who day to day talk about this stuff inside and out. Uh, and special thanks to my colleagues from the University of York who came today and helped me make sure that I finished my paper.